Hi, everybody. Welcome. Thanks for joining us and welcome back if you were here with us last week. Uh, for the people who are new here this week, I'm going to introduce myself and uh, our guest today. Uh, my name is Haley and I'm the Digital Marketing and Events Coordinator with Tech Nation's Career Ready Program. Uh, we're a member-driven association. We represent Canadian tech companies for over 60 years. And our Career Ready program offers training resources, wage subsidies, and different events to support post-secondary students and startups who are interested in tech-based careers. So this is our second uh, in our Startup Skills series, where we invite experts to discuss relevant topics for students and aspiring entrepreneurs. And we hope you'll join us for future events. We will. Um, link our new event newsletter in the chat as well. So you can sign up if you're interested in hearing from us some more. And uh, this session will be recorded just so you're aware and it will be interactive. So we encourage you again to turn on your cameras if you're comfortable and participate with us. So I will pass things over now to our guest speaker Shiraz to introduce himself and start the session. Thanks everyone for joining us. Thank you, Haley. And it looks like I can recognize some of the names from uh, part one of what we're gonna be speaking about, and uh, that is generating influence and winning more often. There's no guarantee that you're gonna win every sale every time. There's a lot of factors that go into that, but my name is Shiraz Sadiq. I have been training sales, uh, sales leaders and building sales organizations for the last 10, 15 years with a lot of success. Uh, record setting uh, sales numbers in both the tech space and software space, hardware, uh, infrastructure and so you begin to realize patterns of what works and doesn't work so if if you all are comfortable i'd love for you to turn your cameras on but if not that's no pressure at all but i'd love to get some a measure of engagement so if i could just ask everyone a quick question and probably the only question that i'll ask everyone uh what are you hoping to get out of today's session and we want to make sure that you are able that we are able to meet your ask. So we'll start with Anne. What are you hoping to uh, receive today? Good afternoon, Shiraz. So uh, I'll be honest, I you know, missed a big chunk of your last session. I am enticed because I work in the neuroscience field. I sell research instruments to neuroscience researchers. And so my primary interest was understanding your framework from a neuroscience perspective of um, you know, and really based on my framework from neuroscience to see whether the two are compatible or not. How's that for an answer? I love it. Uh, it th this happened the last time, uh, and I think it was Rebecca who has some experience with neuroscience, and it always makes all the other guests feel more comfortable knowing that I'm not just making this stuff up. So ladies and gentlemen, <laughs> we have a real neuroscience science professional with us on the call, and she'll be able to, hey, Anne, if there's any uh, value you wanna add, feel free, go for it, because we just want to make sure that everybody feels comfortable that we're not just making this stuff up. It is kind of real. So thank you for introducing yourself and your background. All I see is your name as C. Now, C, are you able to, to share a little bit what you're hoping to get out of today? Oh, this might be me. <laughs> oh, it, 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 this is Carlinda. Go for it, Carlinda. <laughs> okay. Um, yeah, so I'm just someone who's really interested in psychology. I actually work in marketing and like just understanding like consumer insights, consumer needs, and how I can apply my passion for psychology to marketing. So I'm also just curious about how it can be applied to like sales and like neuroscience and all that. And maybe I could funnel all that knowledge into my work or my future startup idea. <laughs> That that's fantastic, Carlinda. And part one, this is part two. Part one will be available online by tech, the folks at Tech Nation, and Haley will certainly keep you abreast of that. And maybe you can check that out as well. Jay, talk to us. Or Mo, go for it. Monique. Hi, how are you? I'm Happy doing to be fantastic. here. Fantastic. Great, you can hear me. Absolutely. So I have been in the world of selling um, in different organizations, enterprise, and leading a SaaS company from a go-to-market perspective. And one of the areas that I really found um, insightful is getting to know really the pain points and the needs 
of the customer very early on in that effective listening um, and trying to find how you can solve uh, their problems um, and sometimes even those unspoken pro problems. And so for me, it's just, you know, taking what you have today because I also didn't get a chance to attend your first session. So really excited to hear that transcript. Um, but, you know, open vessel to, to hear what you're um, sharing today and learning more. But fantastic. And Monique and everyone else, feel free to add value, right? Because it's about learning together and moving forward together. And Rebecca, let's hear from you. Um, yeah, I'm here again just to Yay. Have some more information. Um, for those of you who weren't, who weren't at the last session, um, I said I am neurodiverse, which is, um, I would say, a politically correct term for people who are ADD or ADHD or have some sort of um, neurological um, fun. So <laughs> that's how I'm wired. Um, and I've worked in sales. I've worked in um, like big banks in Canada for years and years and years. Um, and yeah, I always found that I kind of just had to resort to burnout in order to be successful. So I deep dove into the world of neuroscience and tried to find out any resource I could to try to be successful without burning myself out. Okay. Thank you for sharing. And uh, Shiraz, uh, uh, we have some people in the chat who are uh, also wanting to share. Uh, Mo says his mic is not working right now, um, but they're a new startup in the Vancouver area, and their team is mostly made out of and made up of engineers. They're trying to learn how to get into sales because engineering is not enough to build a company. And in the chat, Mary says she is here again because the last session was kind of amazing. Fantastic and welcome uh, everybody in Van Vancouver. I think we have somebody from the East Coast and of course we have some people from here, here on Ont Ontario. And Mary, you're kind, your check is in the mail. Thank you for being here folks and for, for everyone's benefit, unfortunately I can't see the chat, but Haley can. So continue to drop some thoughts in the chat and Haley will work with us to make sure she incorporates your thoughts into today's session. Is that all right folks? And of course at any time, feel free to just uh, speak up and we will take it from there. The neuroscience of sales artistry is really kind of what we're speaking about and generating credibility through connection. Now, fundamentally, uh, in sales for all my life, from, from the age of 13, I went door to door selling chocolate covered almonds. I did. Uh, and in the summer, we would go to businesses. So in the evenings, we would go door to door uh, homes and have my box of, would you like to buy a box of uh, chocolate covered almonds? And, and, and the company was called Youth Supportive Sales. Yes, we pulled on every heartstring possible. And I always wondered, why do I sell more than all my peers? I didn't think I was that much better looking. I wasn't tall, short, like it had nothing to do with my appearance. So what was it? How was I able to get more sales than the average person? And we cycled through a lot of salespeople. Some young people could do it, some weren't cut out for it, but why? And that was that why that always, uh, you know, caused me to create a case study out of myself. And that's what landed us here. And if you were here last week, you would have saw this. I'm just repeating this for everybody's benefit. Folks, that's right. You can buy a customized fry holder. You don't have to drop them anymore, but, but wait, look, look at the bottom here. Hopefully you can see my mouse circling on the bottom of this. You can actually now slip that into your cup holder and you'll never have fries on the floor of your car ever again. Pretty good idea. Uh, they raised, um, from what I remember, 48,000 US in funding. Who did they, con con's the wrong word, who did they trick, hmm, who did they convince to give them 48,000 to build this prototype. I don't know how many units they sold, but it was still available on Amazon as of Christmas this year. Again, I don't know how many units they sold, but if they can sell that, my engineer people on the call, I'm certain you can sell whatever it is that you're offering. And again, here is another idea. How did they get 78, it, the number is anywhere between 78 and 98,000 pounds of investment to create a, device that allows you to take your goldfish, your pet fish on a walk, right? Just watch out for the neighborhood cats. But this idea received that much in funding. Who did they con? Hmm, no. Who did they trick? Hmm, no. Who did they convince to open up their wallet? Now, we are aware of the first half of a response that happens. And we're very familiar with this term. 
fight or flight. OK, so, uh, you know, when we're facing a threat, uh, do we fight against it or do we run from it? OK, and that those t but there's actually four responses that happens. But the, the two popularized ones are fight and flight. I would like to introduce to you two other responses. And if you've heard of them, great. If you haven't, might be hopefully, you know, if it's new, let's see what we can do to gravitate towards this. They are freeze and fawn. Now I'll describe fawn. This is peacemakers. They don't like conflict. They want, they actually avoid conflict and they're just trying to make sure, okay, are you okay? Oh, okay, are you okay? I didn't mean to, I apologize for calling and interrupting you your day. I just have something that might be of value to you, but I apologize for interrupting your day. Um, and, and, and the tonality that comes up from a sales perspective of, oh, I'm, I, 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 I'm terribly sorry for interrupting you, um, and, and, and it's apologetic. But if you're on a mission, we can't go fun. Here's, a, here's an interesting uh, approach, though. If you go fight, you're coming on way too strong. Obviously, flight doesn't work because you can't run from the reality is the only way to generate revenue is to sell, right? And, and, and so you can't run from it. So it's this is what we're going to focus on today. The amygdala is an almond sized element within your brain that is the emotional center of processing, right? So all your emotions get processed through the amygdala. But there's another element that I want to really share with you guys really quick, and that is the concept of homeostasis. Now, homeostasis is not good and it is not bad. So I want to make sure we're very clear about this. It is not good. It's not bad. It's how you train it. Homeostasis regulates, for example, your body temperature. Again, if you get a little cold, kinetic energy kicks in, right? And you start shivering. Ooh, what's happening? You're warming yourself up through kinetic energy. That's why we shiver. And it's an attempt to get the juices flowing again to warm us up. And you know, hopefully you're warming up enough to create a you know, sweat. Maybe not all the shivering will get you there, but that is the instant response. Homeostasis will also do something else. If it's, if it's too hot, it will open up your sweat glands to release moisture as the wind blows over it and cools you down so you don't overheat. So think about homeostasis as a thermometer that regulates normalcy or Watch this, comfort. But here's the problem. If you're calling a company and you want them to open up their wallet, that's a little uncomfortable. So how do you have that conversation with them without setting off their homeostasis that says, wait a second, they're trying to get me to spend something. Wait a second, what is their ulterior mobile? I'm going to, I'm going to push back here. I'm going to push back. Okay. For those, I'll give you another example. For those of you who are in sales or have sales experience, and you're probably familiar with a concept of a sales funnel, it simply means you have all these leads coming in in the top, and you're hoping that they come down at the bottom of your funnel as a signed agreement. Most funnels in, uh, in theory are shaped like this, like a V. And I apologize, I don't have a, sli a slide for this, but most funnels are shaped like a V in theory. The reality is most funnels are shaped like a V at the top, and then they're extremely bloated in the middle with a little trickle coming out of the bottom. That bloating is all the customers that you've been speaking to that say it's a good idea, but we're not ready. It's great, cost too much. It's perfect, but um, I got to get another decision maker. And then you're sending room email after email, follow up after fee follow up. But you said you're interested, but you said you want to do this. How come you're not putting your signature on the bottom line? And so what role does homeostasis create in moving us from that original like, hey, what's going on? And then we're automatically just frozen out. That's the, the gist of what we are going to unpack, how to help unfreeze homeostasis so we can move from comfort, because you got to move your client or per, uh, prospect from a place of comfort to uncomfort back to comfort, 
All right, now let's get into this a little bit. Homeostasis is kind of like that Goldilocks life, right? It's like everybody wants their porridge, uh, you know, it's they don't want it too hot. They don't want it too cold. They want it just right. Or they're better their chair. They don't want it too hard. They don't want it too soft. They want it just right. Now, folks, if you can help craft your message in a way that your customer is receiving it to suggest that it is the perfect temperature, the perfect stiffness, and the perfect comfort level, you're going to win more often. And that's what we're going to do right now. Now, before I continue, any thoughts? Is everybody tracking uh, with what we're presenting to you so far? We're going to get into some solutions, but so far, just laying that foundation, any thoughts or questions? And Haley, if you could help with that, because I just can't see the chat. Uh, we don't have anything in the chat quite yet, but feel free to chime in or mute, unmute your mic if you'd like to say anything. Perfect. So I'm going to I'm going to continue on here. We spoke about this last last week. The idea is to move people from. Comfort to uncomfort back to comfort. And one of the ways you move people is through emotion effectively becomes energy in motion, right? And so how do you keep energy in it? Well, let's get into this right now. Somebody mentioned this off the top and I apologize that I, I tried to write your name down, but I, I, I didn't catch it. But if that's you, just give yourself some love in the chat. Say, hey, that's me. Uh, you talked about pain and you spoke about pain points. Here is a key takeaway. You never sell anything. You always solve. Again, you never sell you always solve. So our engineer friends, I'm envious of you because that's what you're in the business of doing is solving challenges, right? That people in the market are facing. And if your product can solve a lot of their pain, you're probably going to experience a lot of gain in your bottom line. How you communicate that now is important. And again, we're going to we're going to build through that model. So this is a very strong consideration. Again, your brain will register pain and it wants to avoid it. So you're not selling anything. If you can resolve pain, you win. Now craft your sales and marketing language to our, our, our marketing folks that are on the call. If you can craft your language in a way that suggests that you're resolving pain, you will get further into the sales engagement more often. And Monique so, says in the chat, uh, love the problem, solve the pain. Thank you, Monique, right? And, and, and that's where, 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 where we are residing is resolve that pain. How do you figure out that pain? All right, now here's the other side because there's always the other side of the equation, okay? If you can add pleasure, the amygdala will like you. The amygdala, and if, if you were all adults here, it's okay. The amygdala also registers sensory elements like touch, smell, like sexuality. So the brain registers. That's why some uh, uh, I'm of a certain generation, I'm a little older than probably a lot of you folks on the call right now. But uh, in the late 80s, early 90s, almost every beer commercial had uh, half clothes women uh, on a boat somewhere drinking a beer or holding it in their hand because they actually weren't allowed to drink it during a commercial. Why? Because they're trying to register a certain lifestyle with pleasure with their product. OK, so again, in your technical conversation engineers. This is really big for you if, if you're in the tech space and if you are by nature a technical person, an engineer, you're probably big on this element. You're really big on pain and solving problems, but are you marrying in the pleasure? Can you allow me to understand the pleasure that I will experience by doing business with you? And you'll get further into your engagement. Now, ultimately, your product is going to speak for you. These techniques are great. All they do is advance you in the process of your progress. Okay. But again, technical folks, 
you have to turn on the emotional pleasure side of your sales engagement and you'll see how much that helps you. Here is another uh, big element that we are not really registering in wider sales conversations. We know that pain is a big topic, right? We're always talking about pain points, pain points, pain points. But folks, the reality is pain is equivalent to shame in the mind and people don't want to talk about their shame nor do people want to aggressively talk about their pain. As a matter of fact, as I shared last week, uh, most folks, well, if they have a cut, they'll, put, they'll cover it up with a Band-Aid. You know, people wear makeup if they feel like their eyes are puffy. Like, we don't want to expose what we don't feel is a positive side to our existence. So, in as much as we're trying to un uncover pain points, hey, can you also speak about your pleasure, but can you also speak about the potential gain? And let's use that word pain, but, but you, folks, we have to get into the habit of switching that P for a G. At some point, we have to think about the potential gain of your product and bake that into your sales communication. It's not enough to just solve problems because homeostasis will say, hey, wait a second, you're talking about my pain. I don't really wanna talk about, about my pain, but if you talk about pleasure, I might soften up a little bit. Wait, you're gonna make me feel more comfortable? Wait, you're gonna make my future better? What if your conversation was trifold? It was about potential. It was about pleasure and pain, but don't go too strong on one or the other. So again, the encouragement here is to go on all three fronts. Why? Because here is a reality. There are four laws of habit modification that uh, uh, has anybody, you, know, you just, just drop it on the chat. Have you heard of J James Cleary? He wrote a book called The Ato uh, uh, um, Atomic Habits. So I want to give him a full credit for this. He has these four elements in what it means for habit modification. And I'm going to apply this into our conversation on uh, sales engagement from a neuro sales perspective. The first stage is obvious, then attractive, easy and satisfying. Of course, you can read that. Now, let's let's uh, break this down from a messaging perspective. So for our marketing folks. The idea is, can you give me a cue or a clue as to who you are immediately? Immediately. Step one, it's your marketing material. You can't sell if they don't see. How do they see? It's what you market. In what they see, will it will it be relevant to their three things now, pain, to their pleasure, and to their potential future state, their gain of working with you? Is it relevant? So the cue in the visual, because we are visual creatures, right? Most people are visual learners. Again, most people are visual learners. So how you represent your product from a marketing perspective is huge. So what is that cue? Is it relevant to my pain, to my pleasure, and to my potential gain? The next step as you're moving forward in this is, wait a second, um, can you make me salivate a little? One of the principles of, uh, you, know, you can just drop in the chat if you're, or, or just speak up, you know, if if you are uh, familiar with Pavlov's dog and uh, I'll quickly go go over that and you know thankfully we have some smarter people than me on the call and they'll validate you know of what I'm, what I'm speaking about it was essentially um, Pavlov had some dogs and what he would do is every time he would feed them he would ring a bell the dog began to it's interesting the dog began to associate the ringing of a bell to being fed now, what would happen is Pavlov would ring the bell, but would not feed them. But interesting uh, observation, the dogs would begin to salivate at the thought of food because they heard a bell. So they associated, they associated the ringing of a bell to being fed. Here's another uh, reality of how our mind works. I, I, again, we're all adults, I can talk about stuff like this. Uh, 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 in most cases, is se a sexual encounter. It's the lead up and the build up, not the act of 
that creates this salivation craving. Active, okay, cool, but it's the buildup to it that is also very important. So how attractive are you in print, online, in person? I'm not talking about your physical appearance. Now, I'm gonna make, make sure I get this right. That's not what I'm speaking to. What I am speaking to 100% is your marketing material. Does it make me want what you have because it's relevant to my pain, my pleasure? Don't forget that element, folks. I know I've repeated about 14 times. I'll probably say it another 13 times. Uh, and the potential gain. The next step is in your sales engagements. See, is it easy for me to do business with you? Guys, uh, people are lazy. People are lazy. And if you can do the work for them, you're gonna win more often. Why? Because people would prefer an easier path to their solution than the harder one. That's just a reality. So how easy it is it to connect with you? Have you put in those response mechanisms all over, all over the place? Well, yeah, they can chat with us online. Okay, that's easier for you, but what if there are still decision makers who would rather pick up a phone call? You just cut out some of your market by being cute because the trend is everything goes online. Okay, am I, am I against going online? Absolutely not, but are you expanding or shrinking the band of people that you can reach? It's not about what's easier for you to run your business, it's about how easy it is for a customer to get in touch with you. You gotta think about what's easy for them. How do they respond to you? Has anyone been frustrated by, hey, I, I, I need something. So you jump online and you're on, you're, you're, you're on your chat bot and it's just chat bot don't, just the artificial intelligence is still quite artificial. They just don't get it yet. Again, am I knocking technology? Absolutely not. But I'm not saying or, I'm saying and. Again, make people's ability to work with you easier and you'll find you'll have more sales engagements. Secondly, as far as ease, your process. Is your process easy to complete a sale? How many hoops do I have to jump through to do business with you? Have you considered that element? If you haven't, just some encouragement. Consider the process of completing a sale with your organization. And again, if you can make it simple and easy, you're gonna take the pressure off of what? Freezing people like, oh my gosh, this is way too much. Has anybody, well, let me ask you guys a question. Drop in the chat or just take yourself off mute, it's cool. Like, have you ever experienced, man, I gotta read through all of this just to get my cell phone activated? Like, I, 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 rocket science? Has any of you, if you've experienced that, think about it. Are you creating those roadblocks and freezing people to get a quicker response to your, your signed sales agreement? And the last one is, are you represented as satisfying? Meaning, is there a reward at the end, potential gain and resolution, less pain? Which in both cases leads to what? pleasure. Again, I'll repeat that. Your resolution, meaning lower pain, reward, higher gain equals by default, more pleasure. Now, what does behavior modification or habit modification have to do with what we're speaking about right now as, as far as homeostasis? Well, that's just it. We're trying to work with and train our customers or train our process to make it easier to sell, to solve and to serve. I'm gonna move, I'm gonna switch gears here a little bit. Any thoughts or questions? Haley, again, my apologies, I can't see the chat, so anything you can do? Uh, no, nothing coming through just yet. Okay, awesome. We're gonna speak about a model called merit. So switching gears here, I'm gonna take you through elements 
that represent, I'm gonna take you through five elements that represent pain, pleasure, and potential gain. So here is the first element. The, again, the model is called merit, meaning what is what value or merit does your product or service have? And for our marketers, how well do you communicate the merit, meaning the value of your product or service? And it tends to fall into five categories. So, you, so here's the first one. The first one is money, monetize. So Rebecca, you were so helpful the last time. And so I'm gonna pull on you if you're okay with that. Are you okay with that, Rebecca? Are you, are you still with us? I am, but I had to quickly respond to a work email, so I missed the last little bit. That's okay. That's okay. We're 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 we're, we're starting something fresh here. Okay. Uh, uh, if you're able to work with me, and then Carlinda, I'm gonna ask uh, ask if you can help out next. So, if we look at the word uh, merit, the M representing money, meaning finances, meaning budget. Mm -hmm. What is pain? or gain of your product when it comes to money? Um, like the overhead cost. Okay, so you're saying that your product can help lower their cost mm -hmm. from an, their overhead infrastructure costs. Correct. Okay, now, so what you're doing is you're eliminating pain because you're saving them money. Mm. Okay. So a great marketing term would, would be building up or a deck, a proposal, will speak about how much money you could actually save them. Because money registers in the brain as a resource that is a high priority to manage. And if you can save them pain and money, okay, let me show you the other side of that. Does anybody have, and thank you so much, Rebecca, does anybody have a product or service that can help companies gain money. All right, and that might be the point here. I assure you that all of you have a product or service that in some way, shape or form will make a company money. Why? Because even if you save them money, didn't they just make money? because their costs are lower, so you've just created a budget for them to spend in something else. So when you look at the concept of money, I would encourage you to think about the pain and the gain of money, and then craft your language accordingly. Now I'm gonna go through all five, and then we're gonna tie it up with a worksheet right at the end. Okay, so I'm just gonna move on to the, to the next thought here, and that is energy and effort, again, the reality is people are lazy. If you can make their jobs and their lives easier, you'll win more often. I assure you, your product or service probably will save people a lot of energy and effort. And if it does, speak about the gain, meaning how much effort they will save, and pain, again, how much energy they'll be able to redirect towards other initiatives. Again, the E in merit, your value proposition is energy. Can you save them their cycles in getting this exact same thing done? And if you can, communicate it. The next one is relate, meaning relationships. Look folks, at the end of the day, people buy from people. It's that simple until you break the gravitational pull of brand recognition and you are a brand that everybody knows, like a Coca-Cola, a Microsoft, a Google. If you're there, congrats. If you're not there, which is probably most of us on this call, your ability to be a constant presence, meaning a friend, meaning someone that they can actually hang out with, without selling them something matters. We will we'll call this relationship selling, right? Folks, can you actually be somebody who's human and laugh a little and lighten up? Because if you're going in there with your, for example, en engineers are great. Sometimes people bucket them with accountants and say that they don't have, an they don't have personalities. I kind of disagree. 
I think that everybody has a personality that people can get along with. Do you let your personality shine? Because at the end of the day, people buy from people. Can you be the type of person that I want to spend time with? Can you relate to me? Because if you can relate to me, you're serving a basic need here for community and being a part of a tribe. Really important. And again, I'm going to go through a worksheet with everybody and you'll see how this all comes together. Impact. All right. This one is interesting. Our, 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 our marketing friend, uh, are, you, are you still on the call? And can you, can you just say hello to us, our marketing friend? Oh, that me? <laughs> yep, yep. So I'm going to ask you a question. What is, and I apologize for putting you on the spot, if you're not at this stage with your organization yet, that's okay. But can you tell me what your VPS is, meaning your value proposition statement? Do you have that uh, one strong sentence that says, this is the impact that I make? Mm, that's a good question. I haven't built out um, something yet. It's more so of a concept. Um, but I guess in terms of the impact that I would like to make, um, let me search at what VPS means again. My apologies. Value Your value proposition statement. And, and, and I'll give you a couple, uh, just a moment to think about it. Unfortunately, in sales, we're doing this, hey, here's my 30 second elevator pitch. The unfortunate thing about an elevator pitch, it makes it all about you. But if you really care about your customer, you're making it all about them. Mm -hmm. And we're crafting our marketing language as if it's all about us. Uh, they're not interested in you. They have a problem that needs to be solved. So your impact statement is created and crafted in such a way that it's representing your client. And if you can craft that language, what are you going to do? You're going to help them become more comfortable. And when they're more comfortable, they're going to loosen up when they're more, when they're going to loosen up, they're going to unfreeze, meaning they're going to release homeostasis to say, this person is a part of our solution. They are going to resolve pain, add gain, pleasure, and I'm going to let them in. It's okay. Come on in. I'm not going to gate you. You get to come in. And I would encourage everyone to come up with a value proposition statement that is packed with benefit to money, to energy, to relationship. T, of course, is time, and we're going to touch on that. And when you can do that, you're going to win more often because up front, again, James Cleary, going back to his behavior modification, people will look for that first step, that cue. What's the original thing that I see? And that's that one value proposition statement. Look, we live in a short cycle world now. No one's taking the time to listen to you go on for 15 seconds, let alone 30 second elevator pitch. Does it take time to craft your language? Yeah. Does it take time to perfect it? Yeah. But is it worth it? That's up to you to, to decide. Can you get we have there? some uh, comments in the chat here? Monique says uh, they like this model of finding fit. And Mary says it's a good point. We have to elevate their needs and their wants. Thank you to the both of you, Mary. Yeah, you know, uh, making it all about them because now what are they thinking? I'm not doing anything to you. I'm not selling you anything. The unfortunate side of, for example, a, a, a cold call. Uh, when we're in like a telemarketing uh, lead gen business development role. It's like this tennis match where I say something, knock it over, you respond, you hit it back over the net, and then I respond, and then we're going back and forth until this I hit this overpowering shot and I win, but if I win, you lose. Why would you want to make your customer lose? The whole point is don't sit across from them. Get on the same side of the table with them. Evaluate your document side by side, right? Make it so that it is a dance, not 
a competition to win. There is no, as soon as sales becomes confrontation and competition, you lose. Why? Because you're going to have to beat them. And if they feel like they lost, it's a different mindset. So to Mary's point, she probably approaches it. I'm your, uh, like, uh, I'm here for you. Hey, look, here's the impact that we can have in your organization. And I apologize. I, uh, I, I actually unmute and then I went on so much, but I'm just trying to respect time, but we will get back to you. And my apologies, I've been calling you my marketing friend. Can I just get your name? My apologies. Oh, my name's Carlinda. And I added uh, okay. the our, our, my value proposition in the chat. Fantastic. And unfortunately, I can't see it, but uh, do you mind sharing that with us? Yeah. Um, so our fully furnished co-living housing solution um, helps newcomers save time, build relationships, and save money. Okay. You got time, money, and relationships all in there. All right. And now what happens is your next statements back that up because everybody can say that. And, and, and we're going to talk about that in a minute, but you're on the right track. Fantastic stuff, Car Carlinda. Fantastic stuff. The last element in merit is simply time. Here's another reality, and it is absolutely a reality. Most people are not as busy as they claim. You really are not as busy as you think that you are. We live in this hectic, paced business environment in Canada, but yet all of us find at least half an hour to check out our socials every day. Are we really that busy, or is it that we prioritize what we want to prioritize? Okay. Now, having said that, if you can walk into a company and you can say that your product saves them time, time is a high prioritized resource. If you can walk in and said, it will make you time, it'll create time for you. That is messaging that you don't have to reach beyond. It's fairly straightforward. And again, that message is merit. I'll just go right back up where it says it all together. M-E-R-I-T, the value of your product or service, when you frame it in this model, will loosen up homeostasis because you're speaking their language in their comfort zone of everyone's going to be comfortable with you if you talk about resolving their pain. Everybody, uh, it, it, you know, and you're going to save them money. Everybody's going to be comfortable with you if you're saving them effort. If you are a decent human being and you're not too aggressive, or too fawny, well, guess what? You are probably gonna get deeper into your sales cycle. What's your value proposition statement? It matters because again, as J James clearly has represented in Atomic Habits, the first step is that cue. Can you send me a signal that you can be a part of what I need to regulate? And of course, time. Now, when we look at this sheet here. I just want to encourage everybody to, you know, think about your product or service. Look, if your product does not save a, a, a company time or a, a save a company money, or if it does not make them money, hmm, then you need to deprioritize de that in your communication. Because perhaps uh, our, our, our engineer folks on the call if you're still on the call, what is it that 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 you guys are developing and are taking to market? Oh, I think you guys are the ones that said your mic isn't working. My apologies. My apologies. No, no problem. Uh, would anybody like to share what their product or service is? OK, that's OK. But, uh, End of the day for a lot of folks, that's okay. We're, we'll just keep on moving forward and I'll just use a random example. If, if you guys were to take this model, and right now it says M for monetize, right? If you were to do this five times and go through it, what pain are you solving when it comes to their money? Essentially, are you saving the money? Pleasure, how are they gaining money? And then what's the potential? the future position that you'll put them in because they bought your product. But what if you were to replace this M with the word, with the letter E, meaning energy and effort. 
and you do that exercise again. Folks, I'm giving you the opportunity to create 13 pieces of language that you can now use in your marketing material and in your sales pitches. And if you can frame it this way, one of the hardest things to do is get that script going. One of the hardest things to do is getting copy for your website. It's kind of challenging. Put it in this frame and you'll be speaking a sales language that will help with the amygdala and homeostasis to regulate you as something that they want on the inside. Now, if uh, again, if you were to go through that this this exercise, the reason why I said 13 and not 15 is because four of them you have three for money, energy, relation, how to relate, uh, and time. So four times three obviously is 12. Impact, folks, right. Once you go through that four times, take that language. Now you'll have 12 pieces of language and begin to craft your value proposition statement. It keeps it simple. And it's hard for a lot of folks who aren't you used to wordsmithing. But again, here's a model to help you frame all of these a wonderful, amazing thoughts and create language with it. Now, before I move on to this last part that we're going to chat about, we're, we're right up against the clock a little bit. Are there any thoughts that you guys have or questions at this point? Monique here, I have one. Go for it. Yeah, do you have any examples of value props that you've seen of companies that you thought nailed it on this merit model like i think it's a really interesting or have you seen anyone go through this exercise as a template that you've seen been uh, really good at crafting a really good value prop yeah um i've taken uh upwards of uh, uh medium-sized businesses alone i've taken uh, maybe 60 70 companies through merit and in each scenario and situation the challenge wasn't uh, I'll give you a bit of a backstory, Monique here. The challenge was never um, uh, a shortage of words. It was how to frame those words. And mm -hmm. then of that, create a value proposition statement. So the purpose of this exercise, Monique, is to really help you frame that language and put it into these 12 streams, meaning pain, pleasure, and potential for each of the four resources, meaning money, energy, uh, relationships and time to create the I, the impact statement. Now, some to answer your question specifically, uh, you actually know some of them, uh, and you would have heard some of them. Um, does uh, does anybody um, is anybody familiar with any of uh, CIBC's um, uh, lo logos and their statements that they make their 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 their, their catchphrases? Any bank? Any bank? Yeah, I'm thinking um, you're richer than you think. And that okay. is it Scotiabank? That's BMO, I believe. Or oh, no, okay. no, no, you're right. You're right. You're right. You're right. Um, uh, CIBC's uh, um, used to be, um, we're there for you. Hmm. Okay, so let's, let, let's evaluate that one just for all of us, just for a quick m moment here. Uh, what the heck? What does a bank have to do with relation? Oh, it has everything to do because I need to trust you with one of my prioritized resources in life, money. And mm -hmm. if you're here for me, uh, that means there's access to my funds. You're thinking about me. You're available to me. You're making me feel more comfortable. The power in that one phrase. CIBC, we are here for you. Or in some uh, iterations, they would say, we're there for you. And what were they hitting? They're hitting relationship, relationship, relationship. And it meant everything. We're here. Wait, that also speaks to availability, which is time. And this, they have that phrase in the season where they're expanding banking hours. Again, I'm a little older than you guys. But when they're expanding banking hours, that was a part of why they, why they came with that phrase. CIBC, uh, we're there for you. And then it became, we're working harder for you. 
uh, and, and but what does relationship have to do with it? The Q. The power there, um, Monique, is the Q, right? Because the first thing you're, you're hearing is relationship. Oh, money. Wait, I'd, I I need somebody I can trust. Mm -hmm. Does that does that one example uh, help? And, and, and there's a couple more I can take you through. But so far, does that one make sense? Yeah. What they're thank really you. getting uh, perfect. And thank you. Thank you, uh, Monique, for uh, helping out there. Uh, what they're really getting at is. Can I trust you? Mm -hmm. See, um, when Carlinda shared her value properties, if we save you time and you, we're, we're really nice people and but can I trust you? Because here's the reality. Everybody can make the claim that I'll save you time. Can you back it up? That's where the relationship is so important, right? Because I, if I trust you, chances are I'll do business with you. So sincerity matters. That's why that R is right in the middle strategically in merit because everything hinges on that relationship and that relationship is built on mm, sincerity and trust. So great question. Uh, any more questions or thoughts? Yeah, one more on the follow up of that. Are there any books that you recommend on the merit idea that, you know, because there's the typical value prop statements that's like insert your benefits here, you know, talk about this. And then so if you don't do the work on the benefits solving these five areas, you likely miss the mark totally on the value prop if you just insert your benefits. Yeah. Uh a resource on this. So uh, for a living, I work with Canadian SME Business Magazine and um, uh, I host all their large events and I host uh, uh, three different podcasts for them as well. So it's a lot of conversations that I get to have with business leaders from Vic Fidelity to the folks at Google, Microsoft, like C-Suite, everybody. I get to hang out with everybody. And um, Merit, there isn't a book out because I haven't wrote or written it yet. That's my content. Ah at Leverage Consulting. And the reason why I bring up the magazine is we're bringing up something called the bookshelf and I've been encouraged to write it down and capture it uh, in written form. And so by the end of this year, finally, I'll have uh, carved out the time and worked through uh, a prototype of what that, um, it will really be a workbook, not necessarily a textbook. And so it'll be available by the end of this year. But yeah, you won't find anything on merit because it was something that we developed ourselves at Leverage Consulting. Amazing. Well, look out for the book then. Awesome. Awesome. All right. But with just a, uh, we want to respect everybody's time and thank you, Monique. Thank you, Carlinda. Thank you everyone for, for participating. It just makes it so much more uh, uh, meaningful when we get to hear your voices as well. Um, here's a reality. I shared this last week, but I want to share it again because it's really important. And you guys can read. So I don't need to read it for you because you guys can see it on your screens, hopefully. And because of this reality, you need to be human. That's why. People will complain about $3,000 tuition, but they won't complain about $65 to go see a movie with popcorn and two drinks. Well, maybe they will because some people just whine and complain. Stay away from people like that. But the point is, uh, it, it's just true. And the concept, if you smash them together, is edutainment. It's, I, I get to work uh, a while ago for a number of years. I, I, I was doing some work at McMaster uh, for seven years. And uh, one of the number one challenges, so what they would do is they would give me their fourth year students. And I had, I had the opportunity, the privilege to really to mentor them for uh, a period of about 10 weeks and um, in, in a bunch of different uh, disciplines. And their number one complaint and why they gravitated towards me is like, Shiraz, we like you. Shiraz, you make it simple. Because they were up against all these professors who like didn't know how to relate and connect to their audience. But if you carry that forward in your professional life, are you someone who is entertaining the concept of edutainment? You have, you have to make it engagement, engaging. 
there is a responsibility almost. Why? Because now we're competing with a short cycle mind that can just scroll through their feed real quick and you don't want to be scrolled through. What's going to catch their attention in that queue initially? The world has changed, man. We're in a short cycle again. So you got to get caught. How do you get caught? Be entertaining in your education and in your information. Really important. So again, again, we went through this last week, but why are we here? We're here because we want greater credibility. We want to be able to connect with our audience, grow our confidence in how we do that. So our competence shines in all that we do, ultimately making our customers more comfortable so we can communicate our message because the person that matters most really is your customer. That matters. At the end of the day, the, 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 these are my dad jokes. I take them everywhere with, with that I go. Uh, I got two kids in university and and they hate when they know that I'm showing my my my, my dad joke side of life. But I don't care. I don't care. I, I like like guys, you got to have fun a little bit. Like you got to enjoy life because then it makes it sweeter and it makes the highs OK and the lows palatable. Fun is an element that it triggers the the the, the, the look the 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 neuroscientific benefit of just enjoying life is huge. I'm not gonna get all into all that. We got a couple people on the call. Maybe they can help us with the terminology, but it is just huge. If you can just smile more often, so have fun with this process. If you look at it as work, you're gonna, yeah, it, it can take its toll on you. But if you just have fun with it, knowing you're not gonna be perfect the first time you begin to craft your language, but have fun with it enjoy the process enjoy the journey and when you get to the other side you'll find that your clients too will enjoy what you have to offer so that really is you know we're up, right up up against the clock thank you everyone uh, i'm going to hang out for, for for a little bit if if anybody wants to um uh, if anybody wants to uh have any questions or thought feel free to to ask them if not, thank you, and I'll throw it back to Haley. But the one thing I will add is, Haley, when are we back for a couple of sessions in um, in March? We're going to do two in more. In March. Yes, I actually just put a link in the chat if anyone's interested in joining us. Uh, it's not always Shiraz that we have for our speaker series, but we're lucky enough to have him for four events. So I put a link in there. It's um, the CTAs that really matter, the calls to action that really matter. And that's another two part series that'll be on March 2nd and March 9th. So these are all free. If you're willing to join us again, we'd love to have you back. That's great. Yeah. Thanks a lot, Shiraz. And this is really, it's nice to be able to hear um, a different perspective on value props. I think there's a very standard way of looking at it, um, fill in the blanks type of approach that can easily be, you know, misconstrued and, and um, it can flatline what your business actually does. And I like your idea of bringing really that personality to the forefront and um, but your merit in, as a model is just a really great way of, of thinking about, you know, what makes a product unique and relatable. Yeah, thank you for sharing. That's you got to awesome. write your book. <laughs> There's a few different concepts that we're in the process of writing down. It'll end up being a course of some sort, and we already have people that are going to pick it up, uh, so we'll be able to share it uh, across a larger platform as well. But thank you for the encouragement. You're welcome. We have some thank yous in the chat too. Carlinda and Mary say thank you. And Mary's looking forward to the upcoming workshops and really likes what they're learning here and is different than all she's heard before. So good to hear. Thanks, Mary. <laughs> Thanks, Mary and Carlinda. OK, great. All right. Well, well, thank you so much again, everyone, for joining us. Um, thanks for sticking around, and we hope to see you back at some of our other events. Uh, thanks so much for us, and have a great rest of your day, everybody. Thanks, Haley.